You are listening to the Living Legacy Podcast. This weekly podcast inspires you to step outside of your comfort zone. My name is Zakir Muhammad, and I'm your host of the Living Legacy Podcast. I am a cancer survivor, brand cultivator strategist, author, and world traveler. This Living Legacy Podcast features women of purpose sharing stories of resilience. They are single and married. They are artists and entrepreneurs who run businesses and juggle parenthood. If you are ready to hear interviews about professionalism, entrepreneurship, travel, life, and love, you are in the right place. They will share stories of how they overcame adversity while seeing life through a different lens. Let's get into it. Welcome back to Season 3. First off, I just want to say thank you for listening during the off-season. I appreciate you listening to previous episodes, and I also appreciate you for leaving feedback. You know, let me know what you enjoy and what you don't enjoy about the episode. All it does is help me to continue to grow. So for season two, you learned a bit more about me um, as kind of sort of a marketing tactic for my memoir, which is now out, called Seeing Life Through a Different Lens. And I kind of also intentionally interview people that align with different phases of my life. So if you have not heard it, I gave you a sneak peek of the book in episode 33. So please be sure to listen to that. And so I've been thinking about it, thinking about it, but I didn't want to do too much rebranding. So I just decided instead of renaming the podcast itself, the theme for season three is basically going to be the title of the book, Seeing Life Through a Different Lens. So, of course, we're still going to continue interviewing women who have amazing stories of overcoming adversity with resilience. But I'm intentionally going to vet uh, people through the pre-interview process to make sure that we not only have a connection, um, but the story is definitely going to be something meaningful to you. I've been looking over my statistics over the episode that you like the most. And I definitely see that you love the real life topic. So not just the stuff that only I can relate to, only a handful of people can relate to, but everyone wants to learn about real estate. Everyone wants to learn about how to heal through their emotional traumas. And everyone wants to learn how to get married, <laughs> right? So those were the top three um, episodes. And I also know that you love the episodes where I connect with people. I've talked to the people who I know in person. So. I'm also going to feature a few more of those. So it's going to be a short season. What I've decided is because I'm also going to be doing some book promoting, it's going to be a very short season. And I'm just so grateful to make it to season three. So this first episode to start off the season is you're going to get the chance to meet my mom. So you met my dad. In episode five, if you've been with me since the first season, you've met my dad in episode five, and now you get to meet my mom. And my mom is so amazing. You'll get to hear it for yourself. And we talked about everything. And we talked about so much that this episode is literally going to be split into two parts. Um, The first part is definitely talking to us, talking about the book. I'm talking about my childhood. And the second half is going to talk about marriage as well as what's next for us as far as the book goes, as far as uh, our visions go. And yeah, I hope you heard, I hope you learn a lot. In February, the end of February, early March, of course, since February is a leap year, we're going to be celebrating one year of podcasting. Yay! Of course, it's very difficult and a lot of work, but I'm so grateful that you're still listening to episodes. And honestly, my word for the year is action. You know, taking action, um, having actionable strategies, actionable goals, taking action to complete projects, you know. So podcasting, just like YouTube, is a never-ending creative process. So you hear me talk about the ups and downs of podcasting in episode 23, if that's something you're interested in. But trust me, it is not, just like entrepreneurship, it is not for the weak and weary. <laughs> so I'm going to let you listen to my mom, and then I will see you in the next episode. As always, please be sure to tell me what you love and don't love about the episode by leaving a review on Apple or Stitcher or Podchaser, or even by joining the Living Legacy Facebook group, or just follow at Living Legacy Podcast on Instagram. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. How did you sleep? I was anxious. Why? 
because I wanted to see you. <laughs> and we got to see each other a lot this week, too. Yeah. Because yeah. it's our birthday. Yeah. Our birthday, yes. And did you dream? Yes, I always dream. Okay. And sometimes, sometimes there are dreams that move quickly along, and other times it's one continuous dream. But last night they, they moved quickly along, so it was a variety of dreams. I had a, I think I had a series of dreams today too. It was, um, I was, I was somewhere with other people. Then I woke up to realize I'm like, wait, I'm not there. Cause I was deep into it, wherever mm -hmm. I was. I don't remember now, but I don't, I don't remember telling you this. But at one point, Daddy thought I had to work. Um, he was like, Are you going to work? I'm like, No. Oh, I thought me Mama said you were going to work. But funny enough, when he said that, I'm like. Did Mama know? Because I had a dream that I got called into work. <laughs> they were like, uh, did she know that? <laughs> so. Well, I told him that we would not be late. He told me he got a message. <laughs> but I told him we would not be late. She knows I'm never late, so <laughs> she sent a message to, to him. <laughs> so um, there's been a lot of good feedback on the book. Excellent. And a lot of people just really, at least those who I, I was able to get an advanced review from, were really wanted to know how you felt about life after, right? Because you, like, what, parent, not parenting doesn't stop, but at least at 18, there's like a, it's the end of that chapter, right? Um, what, what is that? There was something somebody said, you, you just take a deep breath and wait for what's going to happen next. You just... <gasps> You sigh and you say, okay, but you go on waiting for the next thing to happen. So, so you were holding your breath for what? <laughs> uh, you just take a deep breath and then you let it go. And you, if nothing happens by the time you let it go, then you take another deep breath. That's all. You just keep on breathing. Okay. So mm -hmm. your first inhale was when I said I wanted to move to D.C., my inhale um no my inhale was when you were in dc and you had uh you attended the workshop and you were talking about the workshop and you found a school that was my first because we were in florida and you were talking about going to uh, dc which was i was cool with that but because my sisters are nearby and your uncle was nearby, so we just were waiting for the plan and hear the rest of the plan. And then the moment I called you and mm -hmm. it was like, I found a school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then the mind went back to work. Okay, and so you exhaled at what point? <laughs> I'm still exhaling. <laughs> Inhaling and exhaling. As long as I'm sitting up, it's good. I'm breathing. So, and that's all you can do is just wait to see what's going to happen. That's the transition, you know, when, when the parent lets go, when you say, now she's got to make these decisions for herself. And when you need us, you call us. And if you don't call us, then we call you and find out why you don't need us. <laughs> 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 so then what was the... I guess, first impression or opinion upon the announcement of the elopement? Well, you know, before we talk about that, okay, let's, let's talk about you. Let's, okay. Let's talk about you because I hear you say, oh, everybody, if you don't know my story, but knowing your story is different from knowing you. And so you are the kind of person who has, has this decisive nature and you make a decision and you start moving in the direction of the plan. And sometimes you want to stop and kind of uh, evaluate the plan along the way and other times you just go straight ahead with the plan. And so um, this whole trip to Africa. Ghana. Well, the first time you went. To so Ghana. Mm -hmm. The first time you went to Ghana, and um, your father and I had, had lots of discussion about that. 
And then when I realized it was happening, then it was a question of, well, what about this and what about that? So in my mind, I went straight to, well, what if something happens? And we're not going to fly all the way to Ghana and, and try to solve this problem. Mm, excuse me. So we had to figure out who was going to be our go-to person, and that ended up being uh, Jackie. So I had to, at that point, get more information from Jackie, become familiar with Jacqueline, and learn who Jacqueline was and what her role was going to be in all of this, and, and you know, kind of go from there. I had to have some more information because as far as I knew, you know, six weeks, was it six weeks? Yeah. yeah. Six weeks was quite a long time. And then along the way, of course, we had adventures and, you know, who knew about what was going to happen to the hearing aids and who knew, you know, <laughs> that about the heat and, you know, and, and then when Jackie said that you were the youngest one, going, that everybody else was already in college, and then I said, oh, okay, and there, there was a mixed group, there were males and females, so, and all these things go through your mind, and oh no, she's not going to fall in love and get married, and so I was preparing myself at Even that then, trip, okay. because I know how, Af how aggressive African men can be, mm -hmm. and so I was just saying all these things out loud, so... And then we took another breath. But I remember I wrote in the journal like the first night that you were gone because I had to learn about the different time zones and the fact that mm -hmm. you were calling me and it was 4 o'clock in the morning and, <laughs> and I had to make all these adjustments to you being there and me being here. So that was our first official separation. You've known me obviously since I was a baby, but uh, but that the first official you like you were here, yeah, yeah, but that but that the first official of like okay, so she's a young adult now, and this is everything that I know about her is like coming into fruition, is coming like seeing I'm yeah. seeing it before my very eyes. Well, see, at that point we were calling you fearless, and now you're telling me you're you're not that anymore. But <laughs> at that point we were like, oh look, she's not even afraid. But um, the first time we saw it was when you went to uh, Costa Rica, so, but that was a short trip, you know, two weeks. But this, this uh, six weeks, that was a, quite an adjustment to be made. Okay. Mm hmm So, but then what was your, well, I guess that's, that's, okay, so first was Ghana, and then D.C., no, and then. No, first was Costa Rica. Okay, first was Costa Rica, then was Europe. Yes. Yes. And then, well, what were your opinions about the people and people? people well, and people? I, I, you know, that, uh, well, there were 43 in the group. Yep. So we had to deal with all those parents. And some of the parents were just um, totally neurotic. <laughs> and then some of the other parents were just real laid back and, you know, not concerned about too many things. But the way that they had structured it was that one parent would get the information and then we had a a tree, a phone tree, and one parent called the next parent, and so and so when I didn't get any calls, and I had to start calling people and saying, well, did I miss something, and and that's when we started emailing, so that made me feel a little bit better. That well, I, you started emailing me. Yeah, I could back communicate with you directly instead of having to deal with the, some of the parents who remembered to call and some who didn't remember to <laughs> call, but um, that was quite an exciting time. I mean, you know, it was a whirlwind trip. The preparation for it, you know, we had to really get ready in a hurry. Yeah, but, well, it was only a hurry because that's when we moved. Cause we started yeah, it, yeah, we started. I got accepted into it in Tampa, uh -huh. and then found a different group to in go. In Fort Lauderdale. Yeah. Yeah, so it was rush, rush, rush. But I think my favorite was the Costa Rica group. They just managed everything, everything went smoothly, and the people were easy to, you know, get in touch with, get things done, and we went on from there. So. But also because they were also hearing. familiar with... Yeah, they were familiar with the hearing impairment, and um, they knew sign language, and I was just really impressed. And that was really um, the first time that, uh, well, Emily was the one who told me about that group, and how they came together and how they were organized. and So they really did a good job. 
nothing was off schedule. Every, you, everything went along as planned, and that was good. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, Costa Rica, Europe, Ghana. Well, my ghost trip in between there um, mm -hmm. to, well, Jamaica with Whitney, mm -hmm. and then uh, Puerto Rico with the Thomases. Mm -hmm. So that was just a weekend, so. So, if we want to know more about you, then, I mean, what do your friends know about you? That's my question. I will, yeah, I will say that I've observed at least most of my friends, at least on a religious basis, are uh, either non-Christians or Christians. So religion is never like, <clears throat> like a factor, per se, but it, and at the same time it is, but there's just a mutual understanding. But they all know that I am adventurous, that I am, uh, I speak my mind as is, I tell it as is, I'm like honest and then like the word that they've used is loyal. Like they know that they can count on me if they yeah, but, need someone to talk to. But they don't know when you're feeling bad. They don't know if you've had a bad day. Right, if I don't tell them. If, if we're not face to face and if I don't tell them, yeah. And if you're having a, a, a medical issue or you're not having a medical issue. Yeah, I have issue, to tell them first that. They don't know that. Now, yeah. um, thinking back, I don't remember. I think there was one. It was um, Almaz, I think, was the only friend that knew you growing up who ever went to any of the medical appointments with us. Yeah. And so I don't know what you talked to her about, but she she had questions for me, so I'm sure she had questions for you because that's how she is. She was. Yeah, and she um but she was just she was just knowledgeable. She was observant. She was like in my mind from she she's one of those who had been here before, you know. So an I old think soul. yeah, she's an old soul. So mm -hmm. I remember sure like just at least telling her the gist of it uh, when I was looking for someone to go with me to the appointment as well. Mm -hmm. Um, so I I was telling her the gist of it of like okay, my eye has to be taken out and cleaned and mm -hmm. all of this, and she's like okay, you know, more people are like oh mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. but her her older sister went um once too, and she Elena she um. Mm -hmm was studying to be the midwife at that time, so mm -hmm. she was okay, too. But, yeah, I feel like I might was the one I didn't have to say anything about, and she just got it. And so do you remember when you lost the hearing aids? You were over at their house at the time. Oh, at their time. house? <laughs> I've lost my hearing aids so many times throughout my life. I remember Ghana. I remember, uh, what was it, when we were in Chattanooga, one of the school days. No, Tampa. Some, I, I remember I have one memory of losing them with Asia. It wasn't my fact that it wasn't. But when, when you but not with them. over at Alma, when you were spending the night with Almaz and you know. lost them. How was that? That was, that was absolute pandemonium because her mom had no idea. and um, That I wore them or something. Well, she knew that you wore them, but she didn't know how you could have lost I mean, that's the part she oh. couldn't understand. Well, what do you mean she lost them? That's what she kept saying. And... And then um, our Maz was saying that when you were bathing or something, you took them off and somebody else came in the bathroom afterwards. Now, the, the reason it, w it was just so much madness was because there were so many people in the house. And I remember <laughs> calling over there and asking um, her mom, well, um, I'm going to come by and pick up Zakira. And she said, is Zakira here? And so <laughs> that kind of made me nervous. And I was like, <laughs> yeah, she's there. And we're looking for her hearing aids. And she was like, she lost her hearing aids? And how did that happen? Mm -hmm. And so, <laughs> so we were just uh, worrying Amatula to death. But so, Yeah, just a reminder for the listeners that this is the family of eight. So the eight well, children. Well, they were five, in the, five that were still like living. In the house. In the house, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you were all step stair in age, not more than yeah, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So and um, actually, Almaz and her, her mom, let's see, her mom was pregnant at the same time that I was pregnant. So you and her were what about a couple of months apart? Six months, two, probably about six months. Six ago. months apart. So yeah, yeah, that was um. That was like your your other family. Yeah, those were my siblings. <laughs> <laughs> those were your siblings. Yeah, yeah. It was fun. It was a lot of fun. So tell us about um, <clears throat> what's going to happen with this book. The book is... Is this, this going to be like 
the book becomes a movie and then the movie becomes a sequel and, and we all go off to Hollywood and it's going to be wonderful, that kind of thing. I haven't thought about a sequel, I'll say that. <laughs> but um, just based off of the support that we've gotten so far, they some people, it's, it's interesting because I, as soon as I announced the book is coming, they're like, yeah, I can't wait to read it. And then some people are like, yeah, I can't wait to listen to it. They want an audio book mm-hmm. first. Mm-hmm. And then another um, person, a uh, co-worker who had purchased it was like, I want to see the movie version of it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, sure, it may be narrated into, uh, I may be become a casting director for it, sure, like a mini documentary. You wear my documentary or video editing hat again um, and do that. But that's as far as I, I, I'm, I've thought about it. It's just a matter of, you know, I am one of few people of color, women of color, who has survived so far, and I think that's the biggest aspect of it. I'm sure my story is very relatable to anyone else who has not just retinal black stomach, but cancer, um, but also just being able to share the light on a person of color. Um, well, when, when I heard you say, and um, you said this the other day to me and your dad, you said you wanted to be a... Uh, the director of photography and that's when I said oh she's gonna make a movie and when I started thinking about that and I said yeah that would be great because um, I always think about how so few people know about retinal blastoma I've, I've talked to a lot of parents and um, I've talked to other families that have children with retinal blastoma and they say the same thing that you know when you tell them they have no idea what you're talking about and then um, when you look at it, it's a global issue because um, we looked at a documentary and this was taking place in India. And they said that most of the parents, the pressure's on the parents because if the parents don't see it and, you know, don't recognize any of the signs, they're not going to go to the doctor and say, you know, something's wrong. You have to see it. You have to know what is occurring before you can even get to the doctor to get a diagnosis. It's not something that, um, you know, I haven't heard yet that one child just decides one day that they look in the mirror and they see something and they tell the parent. It never happens that way. No. It's always a very young child and somebody in the family has to observe the change in the child's eyes. Or even once they start school, because I think that's what we've observed lately, the diagnosis they picked up. In school. When school. Like the teachers, the other kids are like, what's wrong with the eyes? Or Mm -hmm. the guidance counselor, whatever it is, start Mm -hmm. to see something and then bring it to the parents sometimes. Mm -hmm. Well, from what I understand, that the the earlier it's caught, the more likely the vision can be uh, preserved. If it's later on in life, say, you know, the later years of elementary school, then it's hard because sometimes you don't know that this is happening and the tumors grow very quickly and they move around the body and then this is how a lot of the uh, children who do have not inherited this gene end up losing their uh, total vision. So I think that uh, the movie, if, if it could be done in such a way where you have like vignettes, you know, short stories about situations and people in different places in the world and uh, then when people can see the extremes because some I've seen you know some children have um, not survived and they were under five and some who have survived and they were under 10 and some who have not survived that were under 10 and 11 and then you have a whole different perspective on what the doctors think and what the parents think so you know I'm on Facebook, I, I, I participate in this support group, and now the technology is different, and the treatments are different, and so the parents are asking a lot of different questions. So I always thought that, you know, in my, in my world, that you were going to end up working somehow in medicine, and, or <laughs> and then when you came home after your, uh, your volunteer project and you said, oh no, oh no, that's not something that I can do. And then I said, well, maybe she'll want to be on the other side of it, you know, deal with the medical photography. And then you said, oh no, 
Oh, no, that's not something that I want to do. And so, so then we said, well, maybe she'll want to travel with the Doctors Without Borders. And, and we just kept going on, and, uh, and we wouldn't let go of this medical thing. And then um, when you got to school and you said, well, I'm going to study photography. And I was like, okay, well, there's still hope. <laughs> so so we'll, we'll, we'll let her study photography, and we'll see where this goes. So, so far, I guess that's been, what, eight years now. So that photography has taken me to, well, I guess up to this point. I feel like now is when I feel like I'm actually walking into the purpose, and the purpose is really just using these, my skill of photography and writing to share my story with them and find others to share their story and, and, you know, get, you know, more awareness out there. So Well, when you said you were going to do portrait photography, I said, well, that would be perfect. You can take pictures of all these little children and um, put together a nice collage or something and, and show all their little tiny faces and, you know, and, and put the word out there and help to support this cause and, you know, because there's no cure and people are saying all kinds of things about how, you know, it's, it's genetic and what can you do with genetics. So, um, and then there are situations where it's not genetic. So. It's such a variable, a large variable, that we don't really know which way to approach it. But photography, that helps. Yeah, I agree. Um, that's why I feel like when I finally got to go back to Hell Portrait for the first time after four years, and mm -hmm. you remember the first time I went in 2011, mm -hmm. um, I mean, I enjoy the fact that it, it, even though Hell Portrait is for the less fortunate, um, it can be used, you know, just a way to really interact with people again. And I, and I agree that that could be uh, an aspect or a future project of uh, similar to uh, Nicole Franco. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, just not just in the medical, not in the surgery room per se, but, you know, just get the, the faces or even... I uh, see my vision is really... Because, of course, retinoblastoma is more prominent in third world countries. You think? From the stats that you send me, from when you're running your blog, most of it is the yeah. third world country. And I think it's it's so because, like I said, the parents don't know what it is, and they're reluctant to think of it as a, a life-threatening disease. Or sometimes culturally, if they don't, yeah, they can't do anything. Yeah, and culturally as well. So yeah, and they don't have the facilities to uh, really treat retinoblastoma in a lot of places that are outside the the U.S. and the U.K. I found um, there's more in uh, Canada, per se, than there are in um, parts of Africa. Kenya. Kenya, South Africa. Kenya and South Africa seem to be, you know. Have you sent, sent me one from the Gambia? Oh, yes, okay. And um, then the rest would be, now, around the Caribbean, I've met a lot of, a few families from the Caribbean, and... Um, most of them, they didn't. The child wasn't diagnosed until they were older. They had no idea mm -hmm. what it was. Mm -hmm. So that's where they came up with the the phrase um, "invisible disability." So mm -hmm. if you can't see it and you don't know that this has happened, then you have no idea what this young person is going through. Well, let's let's go back to those days of when I was in school, or. Um, when you're filling out the many forms in, in order for me to get benefits and, and get through the IEP because of the whole thing of, because my, because I did have 2020 at least in one eye, um, and how you had to navigate that world of, of both insurance to benefits, the yeah. IEP, yeah. what was that like? Yeah, well, you know, one thing you learn is that you don't know anything, and so... You have, to, you have to literally just start from zero, you know. I don't know what I'm supposed to have. I don't know what she's supposed to have. I don't know what we're supposed to do. And here we are. So um, you meet people along the way. And I thank God every day for Emily because um, she helped me to not only understand the uh, education portion, the piece of how to develop the service plan for the school, but how to develop the service plan for the student. So, you know, we had to do it from both the, both directions. We had to understand what you needed, and then we had to understand what the school actually was obligated to provide. 
And that's where we found the gaps. Um, a lot of the schools didn't know anything about retinoblastoma, didn't know why they had to do what they had to do, and um, some of them were reluctant to do anything, and others were uh, very happy to accommodate. So, you know, we went from one extreme to the other. Uh, a lot of the teachers who didn't know anything about retinoblastoma did not understand how it impacted you as a student. And then as we got to the older years, then they started to see, you know, certain things that you had to be out of school X number of days and that, um, you know, infections were a problem, um, physical, like flu contact, flu physical contact was a, was a problem, and also, um, you know, just dealing with how you looked different from other students and why. And so, you know, it, it was an education process for everybody involved. I don't, I don't remember ever having, being in a school where there was more than just one child with retinoblastoma and that child was my child. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was like, well, why is she making such a fuss about her child? Her child is doing fine. Mm -hmm. And um, they didn't see you in the morning and they didn't see you in the evening and they didn't see the changes that were taking place in you. And they weren't talking to other parents whose children were not as fortunate as you were. So, you know, it was an education process. You end up talking to a lot of people, and uh, you hope that, you know, they're picking up something along the way. It was hard work. It was hard work. You know you've been labeled as a superhero now. Oh, no, 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 no. Um, <laughs> I'm just a speck of dust. The superheroes are the doctors, I think. I mean, you know, I asked your doctor one day, and I said, well, how do you cope with all this? What do you do? You know, how do you relax? And, and what do you, how do you deal with all these parents and stuff, you know? And, and some of their answers, you know, they kind of, they, they make you laugh because they say, um, well, we're not the ones doing all the work. Y'all are doing all the work, you know? And so when you call them and you're hysterical, they, they have a way of calming you down. And when you call them and something is going wrong and they, they can talk you through it, you know? So it's not just me. It wasn't just me. It was by the grace and mercy of Allah. And, you know, your dad, because even through some of the examinations, I couldn't do it. <laughs> you know, he, he was the one who had to hold you still and, and you know, get us there at 4 o'clock in the morning and 5 o'clock in the morning because, um, you know, I was just, I don't even know what role I played, but uh, I was like the emotional connection between all the insanity. <laughs> everything that was happening, I was able to put everything in little compartments and deal with it piece by piece. But he was dealing with the big picture. Mm. That's how men think. <laughs> and when I was getting a little too crazy, he would say, you need to go someplace <laughs> and chill out, get yourself together, yeah. Mm -hmm. But no, no, it, it wasn't me, you know, I was inspired. Um, I remember when I found out that you had cancer, the first person I talked to was my mother, so she said what she said, and it, you know, it kind of helped me to uh, put things in perspective, so, you know. You, you want to know that your child's going to be okay, and you want to know that uh, you're going to do everything that you can to keep this child alive and well and strong. And that's all you can do, and the rest is, you know, it's up to God. So I say to myself, you know, when I see how, how you're so driven, you know, that you, you put your mind on something and you just, you're, you know, you just go at it with full force, and, and I said, now, is this because she's thinking that she may not be here long enough to get these jobs completed? Or is it because she's afraid that she's, you know, gonna, something's going to happen and, and it's going to take her off of her path? And then I said, well, all of us should be thinking like that. Every single one of us. Nobody knows, you know, what day is going to be their last day, what day is going to be their last breath, and we should all approach life the way you approach life. And you, you know, and I, I commend you. I'm very proud that you take such good care of yourself. <laughs> and then you want to take care of other people, too. So, 
it's really interesting. Yeah, I think I'll kind of answer that question. That's a popular question because most people are like, how do you do it? And I would say, yes, it's the matter of knowing in the forefront that life is short. Mm-hmm. Um, kind of, you know, kind of sort of shorter for me because of the medical disability or, you know, ability. And, but also, yeah, it's kind of in my nature. I mean, look who I got it from, <laughs> you know. You just so, get up and do it, yeah. Yeah. So, and mm-hmm. then, yeah, I think I also want to commend you for your vulnerability because I think also most that do know you, I think most of my network that still really knows you are from Tampa and they all they know is your strength. So I think I commend your vulnerability. That's well, what you know, you, when you see somebody who's really struggling <laughs> with something and you, and you hear other people complaining, about something that that you know they really shouldn't be complaining about <laughs> and you know there's always one person in the room who says okay get a grip you know <laughs> your your problem is not real deep you know it's it's not as bad as you think it is it could be worse and then you take on this this air and people begin to realize you know well okay you're right you know that my life is going a, a real smooth. I had one bad day. I had a flat tire or something, and I can fix my flat tire and go on with my wonderful life. But, you know, there are other people. And I've met some of these uh, kids. I won't call them kids, but children uh, who have retinoblastoma, and they have energy, and they're so smart, and, and they're, they're driven and motivated and so curious about life and you know and they're taking it easy and then it's the parents who are freaking out you know they're just I, I mean some of them even have such great sense of humor that you're sitting there and you're just laughing yourself crazy listening to these kids and when we sit in the waiting rooms for four hours and five hours and and we're watching them and we're listening to them I mean that's where the humor comes from it comes from the child and the parents are just you know we're just following along <laughs> we become part of the package instead of leading we're following so we have to follow the lead yeah because you learn so much from children especially mm-hmm. from the children of the ages before the innocence is taken away sure 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 well you're doing a fine job kill so oh, thank you so are you <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about food we so love food we love food yeah but how do you think food plays a role in my remission? Well, we found that out. You know, we, um, we met the holistic healers and we met the nutritionists and, and we did all the reading. And, you know, you could stop taking certain kinds of medications if you knew how to manage your diet. So we know that now. And we also know that certain foods affect you certain ways. And so when we take that out of the equation, then we just go from there. Um, I, Like I said, I talked to a lot of the other parents, and um, when they realize that you got to get your child to stop eating certain things. McDonald's. Especially McDonald's, <laughs> that, uh, you know, things will change. Their health will change. Uh, it affects your sleep. It uh, um, affects how your blood can be purified. Mm-hmm. And, and that's the big thing. When you're going through chemotherapy and, you know, all these different medications and, and uh, the stress of it all, and it affects your blood circulation, it affects how you sleep, it affects how you feel, and so, you know, you want to control the diet. Because everyone does have cancer cells, and the cancer cells run through the blood, so. Yes, yes, yes. so you got to focus on that. The inside keeping the blood, Keeping the blood as pure as possible. I mean... You know, um, purifying yourself, cleansing yourself internally as well as externally. You know, you have to do it. You have to stop eating all foods at some point and just fast because, you know, that's the ultimate uh, cleansing. But then fasting will also help the stress as well. So, you know, one thing leads to the next. The body, the mind, the soul, they're all connected. And um, being able to get get you to the point where you're eating the right kinds of food. And we, you know, we started at the beginning, so it wasn't a real 
change for you. You were still doing what you did as a, as a baby. So you liked vegetables and you liked fruit. Tomatoes. Especially tomatoes. And you like ice cream. And so we took away the ice cream and gave you yogurt. And we took, took the uh, milkshakes that you loved from, you know, other places and taught you how to make your own. So. And smoothies. Change it to smoothies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so whatever it is that makes you happy, and I won't start singing, but whatever it is that you wanted, we tried to give you what you wanted. Lola. And then, <laughs> and then you started adapting and doing it for yourself. So. Thank you for listening to the Living Legacy Podcast. Be sure to subscribe, follow, and download so you don't miss the next episode. If you want to learn more, you can visit ZakiraNayal.com. That's Z-A-A-K-I-R-A-H-N-A-Y-Y-A-R dot com. Do you have any suggestions on a topic you want to be talked about? Send me an email or leave them in a review. If you love this episode, be sure to share it with your friends.